Welcome to the 139th episode of the Flipped Learning Remixed Podcast, the podcast that mixes cutting-edge technology with learning. I'm your host, Troy Cockrum, along with my co-host, Joan Brown. Hello, Hello. Joan. Hi, Troy. It's still hot, but we're, yeah. we're making our way back to school. You've only got a couple weeks, right? Yeah, we go back on the 17th, and actually we're one of the latest schools in this area. There's a lot of schools that are already back in, started either this week or last week. I think we um, are the latest school district because we go back after Labor Day. And um, But they, they're talking about changing that, so <laughs> shh, don't say anything to teachers. Um, <laughs> but yes, we have a little ways to go, but we have a lot of planning to do. And our topic tonight is part of that planning. Right, so um, one of the things that um, uh, I was reading some research over the summer um, about technology integration, barriers and inhibitors and things like that. Um, what, what Other are, than funding, right? Other <laughs> right. Um, what, what makes teachers not do well with integrating technology. What what is an inhibitor for a lot of teachers? And and uh, one of my professors has done a lot of research on this. And one of the things that I don't think really surprised me, but I hadn't thought about it till I saw that research was that uh, one inhibitor is you need different classroom management skills for a, a technology integrated class, and not a lot of teachers think think about that if they haven't had a lot of experience with technology. And so the problems arise immediately when they haven't thought of a process for this or a solution for that. And it, it deters them or discourages them from wanting to integrate technology. So this podcast is about what kind of things can you look for um, to help classroom management in a technology, technology, technologically infused classroom. We say a one to one. That makes it easier. <laughs> oh, that, that's that's good. <laughs> Even though it may not be one to one, but it's it's still on the same wavelength. And I'm glad you said it had to be different classroom management because um, there are plenty of books out that are required reading for teacher colleges about classroom management that never mention a device ever and they feel that they're doing justice to these new teachers saying yep get out there and use your hand signals and you know call the class to attention and you've got it made <laughs> and i'm yeah. sorry it just doesn't work quite the same way uh but um it's it shouldn't be too daunting it's simply just a change it's not added on and that's what I think uh, at least my teachers get nervous that oh my gosh you know I got to make a new poster full of all these new rules and it's not about making the do not rules because as we all know you never can cover all the do nots the kids are going to come up with something they say that's not on the list and we can't we can't possibly attend to that so if you're simply making the rules about what is a good active learning environment, you're going to get the, the easy way to explain and show and demonstrate what that is. Um, so I think we were, we were talking in terms of, at least I was before we started talking on the show, I, I know when I first started teaching, classroom management was my weakest point, yeah. but I found that good, engaging lessons were the cure. <laughs> Anything that reduced downtime, that was relevant, that I would differentiate the work or create a nice challenge for the students, I think always managed to get rid of all my problem students that way. And I found that out very early and I devoted all my time to lesson planning, which some people do. I'm not going to say that fixes every single problem, but it'll reduce a lot of them. I, I'd like to say, I mean, the first major conference I went to was a behavior management conference. Mm -hmm. And it was, I kind of had this mentality that, oh, if I can just get those kids to behave, I'll be a great teacher. Sure. 
and, and so that's uh, and I learned a lot of the same thing you did. It's really about engaging them and 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 getting them involved in in something as opposed to just trying to manage behavior. And I, I'm using a key word, relevant, because now that kids have devices, making any topic relevant is so much easier. Even the kids can do it on their own. And that's the part that, yes, it's a little scary for some teachers, but suddenly it's taken all of it off of your your requirement to, to go out and find that thing. And sometimes the kid already knows something that's relevant. So um, I have a, an excellent teacher in my school that's doing this in math classes where the kids will do the research prior to learning a topic. And he has them go out and find out, well, when would you use this in real life before he even teaches it? And they're the ones finding the relevancy. And they're so absolutely engaged with what they're about ready to learn because they finally just realized it's, it's worthwhile. I just looked it up. I Googled it. It's there. <laughs> so amazing. Uh, some of these uh, new techniques to how to do a lesson plan. But I think we were here to talk about classroom management. I know I could talk about lesson planning too. Um, <laughs> um, so it's, you know what it is? It's the spotting the misbehavior that, takes a little bit of a keen eye. Um, and you and I, we, we both know um, mm -hmm. JD Ferris Rowe, yeah. and he's got his website where he has these four pictures of being able to detect distracted behavior. And um, simple things that you know it when you see it, but it's kind of nice to remind teachers of these simple little things. Um, so for example, he has, has one that I think is is an excellent and he has real students in the picture and so he shows um, two students one of them is on his device and the other one's looking over his shoulder very intently at what that student is doing and you can guarantee if they can't keep their eyes off of their own work then something on that other screen is getting their attention more <laughs> and that's a, a surefire right. indicator that, oops, that's probably not. And you should be walking over. It's actively monitoring your classroom. I, I am, you know, our kids are one-to-one -one Chromebooks, and mm -hmm. I'm very good at spotting extra tabs that are open. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one trick that I've learned the kids try. They'll have extra tabs, and then they'll just tab back to the screen they think that uh, they that i want to see them on or or if you you'll see a little chat window in the bottom that they've minimized and mm -hmm. um they think they're slide but they may have closed it before i got around to where i could see their screen but mm -hmm. um you just know what to look for and and then i say well wait a second why do you have these three extra tabs open what are those and then they close them really quickly and <laughs> um uh Really, really, I probably shouldn't even say this, but um, on a Chromebook, you can do the keyboard shortcut for the history yeah. very quickly. And if a student likes to tell you that, you know, I've been doing this for the last 10 minutes, if you go grab the history and you can say, no, you were here, here, and here, um, <laughs> you have something to show them that is irrefutable. Yeah. Um, now, everybody talks about the thumbs. You know, when you're talking about cell phones, how fast the thumbs are moving on the cell phone yeah. indicates whether or not they're texting. And that's almost a, a guarantee. <laughs> now, you know, occasionally um, I've seen kids take notes on a cell phone. Um, I occasionally will, will, you know, pull out mine and take some notes and people will look at me like, are you texting? I'm like, no, I'm making a note here. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with, are they supposed to be on that device? Right. If they have a computer in front of them and they were working on that and then suddenly their hand, their head is down and their, and their thumbs are moving, I think yeah. we know something else is happening. Um, and if they're swiping up, they're playing Pokemon Go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you caught me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. And they can do that. They probably put a lure right in the middle of your class. <laughs> and they can just sit there all day. Um, 
So, you know, just catching those behaviors. But there's a couple other things, too, is your, is your uh, design of your seating so that you actually can see the students. Remember, we're no longer the sage on the stage. So teach your desk in the front with all the students facing you ensures that you can't see any computer screen. So teach your desk toward the back and you moving around keeps them a little bit off guard because they're never sure yeah. if you see their screen. And that's important. I feel it's also uh, a really good idea to define digital space as well as physical space. So if you have a chair arrangement in which you can see screens, that's just as good as if you have a certain list of sites that you are supposed to start every day on. You know, let's say you use Google Classroom and that's where you're posting your warm up and you have given the routine that you start each class by looking at that warm up. That should be very easy for you to monitor what is opening up on these screens. Yeah. And um, we do little tricks, you know, put a background color on the Google Doc that they're supposed to be working on. If every screen is bright pink, well, then you know they're all doing the right thing. If one screen flashes a different color, it's easy to see that in your peripheral vision and say, hmm, wonder what you were off doing. Now, granted, when they're doing research, they're going to be all over. And that's just something that you have to know the time and the place for. Some of that monitoring isn't going to be happening as, as perfectly as when they're all on the exact same page. But those tricks are good. Um, I'm even in favor of your YouTube art. You know, if you have a YouTube channel, it should be clear that it's yours. And that way you can tell, oh, you're on mine. Good, good. You know, I can tell good where you point. are. Um, it's just that visual that's from a distance that will help a lot. We, we had a problem um, at a previous school I was with where the kids would log into their personal um, Gmail account on the Chromebooks to try to get around some filters and things like that. So I started making my documents only, they could only be opened if they were logged into their school account. So if a kid said, I, I can't get onto the, I can't get onto the document uh, that, that we're supposed to get on, I knew immediately why they couldn't get on. And I said, well, you need to be logged into your school account. So log out of your Gmail account right now and get in. And so that was just one little trick that I had to make sure they were logging into their school account. That's a great life lesson as well. Um, you know, I, I have to teach the kids with Chromebooks as well. And I talked to them about separating out their school life from their personal life and how important that is because there are plenty of jobs out there where they're going to be monitoring what you're doing on the computers mm -hmm. as well. And, and they may not be too happy if you're shopping on Amazon during the day. And so that's a good skill. You just need to separate it out and learn that early on and you'll be fine. <laughs> um, I think I mentioned the word routines. Do you have any um, specific routines that you probably used in your classroom? that might have aided in maybe even the movement of devices or how kids well, manage them? I was thinking of two that I used quite a bit because I, I, you know, I would let students wear headphones and listen to some music. Uh, and that was another thing. My rule was if you started to sing out loud, you could never listen to music again. Um, <laughs> but I also, I would watch some kids and they would, spend more time changing songs than they would be working. And I'd say, no, you pick a playlist or uh, whatever, you know, you maybe go on YouTube and hit random music or whatever you do, but don't sit there and actively select songs because every time that you do that, you're taking your mental focus away from your work. And so um, if I saw students doing that on a regular basis, I'd say you can't listen to music anymore. Um, so I would kind of teach them that just put it on a playlist and let it play through and then focus on your work. Um, but then one of the problems is if you've got several kids in your class with headphones in and you need their attention, it's difficult to get. So we had a signal where I would just flicker the lights when I needed their attention. 
and then if they took too long to take their headphones out and pay attention then they would lose the privilege to have their headphones in so that was one sort of cue or um routine that we had to get to uh, when you saw the lights flicker you need to take your headphones out focus on the teacher uh, the the other one i had was we called it uh down or around um you know, sometimes you just need to talk to the kids and you see that kid that's staring at their screen and you're like, no, I need your attention for just five minutes. So they have the option. They either turn their computer around so their screen was facing me or put the screen down so they couldn't see it. Um, and so I, I just said screens down or around and they knew close it if they wanted to or turn it around so that I could see it and they couldn't. Uh, so those were two little things that I had to get their attention and, and make sure that things went smoothly when we needed them to go smoothly. I see in our school when we have a computer cart of 30 computers and I'll see teachers say, okay, everybody go get a computer. Well, you can't get 30 kids at a computer cart. So um, some very brilliant teachers have it down to a science of, which groups go and in what sequence. And it, they even have it down to when so-and-so is done, then the next group goes and the next yeah. group. And I think that routine is so important if you do have carts or you have a central location for devices, you need to practice it. You need to correct every time it's wrong so that by December, you don't have to say a word <laughs> because uh, you'll, you'll go nuts if you're having to correct it or having to straighten all the cords in the cart every single day. And now you know, I, know that's some, I see some teachers that have like, you know, classroom helpers that do that and they hand yes. out the device to all the students and it, it, it keeps things clean and organized, but then you have that group of four or five kids that's waiting till the very end to get their device and they usually end up talking or goofing around or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so I like to get them out a little bit quicker than that. Um, so you maybe have more people handing them out. You know, you have five kids that hand them out rather than two or something like that. Um, and maybe just have one stand there and pull them out in stacks and hand them to other kids or, you know. Yeah, um, that's an excellent idea. Um, another one of the things that I've seen and I'd like to adapt, um, and I was trying to remember who came up with it, it's called the Silent 30. And basically, the idea of this was to get your materials out in 30 seconds without making a sound. Um, and I believe that was written up on Edutopia, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure whose idea it was. But we also have, of course, the whole devices thing that you need them to get out or to put away. And honestly, that's the time when kids get so out of focus. Um, when those transitions occur. So it's kind of nice to say, all right, the transition is going to be quiet. The reason why it's quiet, it's not going to take nearly as long. They can't spend, you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds talking to their neighbor, pinching their neighbor. It has to be all quiet. And Silent 30 makes that simple. Um, with that said, I am a huge fan of finding fun timers. <laughs> online because timers are great to keep kids that momentum going you know if you simply say oh let's move well one kid's going fast the next one's going slow and we're all at different you know transition speeds and if those transitions are timed it will keep the momentum of the lesson it's nice to get a break in a lesson but if they're still engaged, you don't want that break too long because then they're gone. So um, timers online, of course, Google. Yeah, that's. The, I mean, I, I'm no fun. I just use the Chrome one and just say, okay, Google, set a timer for two minutes. Start, you know, and um, but then some people are like, well, that's just it's so boring. I need a, a more fun one. So what are the more fun ones? Well, I actually looked for fun 
timers, fun classroom timers, and I found them at onlinestopwatch.com. <laughs> and there are about, let's see how many of them, eight or nine here. Some of them are like a bomb that explodes. Uh, there's a rocket that goes off. One of my favorites is the candle timer. The candle actually melts down. I love mm. that. Um, so I think, you know, depending on what age you've got, yeah. um, you don't want it to be too distracting because they're not supposed to be watching the timer. But also, it's kind of cool. Um, you know, it's just that that little extra. Oh, I have that handy. I've got it bookmarked, um, and I know that all my transitions are going to have some kind of purpose to them and be organized. Um, the other thing that maybe. A lot of folks haven't thought of. they they realize there are going to be technology problems in the classroom. Just like if you're teaching elementary school, you know what? There's going to be kids that can't tie their shoe, right? Technology problems come up every single day. How you start the year and what the message is about that is so important. A lot of folks use the three before me concept, which is a student needs to ask three people before they ask the teacher how mm -hmm. to fix the problem on their device. It's good, but you will run into that that becomes the distraction because if, you know, the program isn't working on Timmy's machine and Timmy's over there asking Bobby and then asking Sally and then asking Xavier, you know, then we've lost four kids <laughs> in the middle of the lesson and they're all huddled together it's great that they're solving a problem, but they're all huddled together trying to solve a problem. And you're saying, what are you guys doing? <laughs> What's happening over there in the corner? So one idea that I think is, is really nice is to have a shared out, maybe even a Google Doc, if you wish, um, computer tips created by students. And anytime a student runs into a problem or comes up with a solution, if you can incentivize that, that they write it up and they explain the answer, make that a shared doc with everyone, searchable doc, have that be the first stop. Did someone else have this before and did they answer it? And then you can ask somebody if you're really having trouble. See, that might encourage that individualized self-help mm -hmm. rather than automatically I get to talk to somebody? Well, you could do it as a, a, form, a Google form too and then have mm -hmm. the spreadsheet shared out so that yeah. just, because I think it might be a little bit easier to search through a spreadsheet mm -hmm. than to search through a document. It and you may, be. yeah, and you can, you can filter those columns. You'd have to yeah. teach the kids how to work with it, but it'd be definitely worth it. Um, You'd want to incentivize it, though. You know, how many kids want to write up something? Well, if you write it up, hey, you get, you know, an extra point or a free recess or whatever you're getting as your, your bonus. I think it's important how the teacher responds to problems as well. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen, you know, sometimes the, the problem is just too complex to solve right there, or you have too many kids bringing you the problem at the same time, you know. Uh, yes. The common one is you forget to share a document, you know, and you put it on classroom or whatever, and kids are like, I can't open this document. And it, for me, I've seen it enough times, I know, oh, I forgot to share it. And so I go in and share it really quickly. Well, then, you know, I had a teacher not too long ago that she was, each kid would request access, and she was going in and giving them all access. And it was taking her forever, and each kid was be like, "Okay, I, I've shared mine, or I've asked for, you know." And and she was like, getting flustered. And it's like, at some point, you, you if you respond calmly and teach the kids, just remain calm, and we'll get this solved. They respond in kind, but if you get frustrated, they tend to sense that, and maybe not intentionally, but they they get excited too, or or. The, the the energy the, the negative energy in the room kind of picks up you know and so uh, and then sometimes I would just say you know what I don't know what's going on I'm I'm looking at this it's I don't know why it's not working we're gonna do something else and I'm gonna solve this later when I'm not standing in front of a classroom full of kids right um, and, and uh, just knowing 
the kids seen seen that it's not a, it's not a reason to panic. We'll get it resolved. It may not be resolved right away, but we'll get it resolved. Is is a is is a good way to model that for kids. Absolutely. Um, if you have someone who is the technology person in the building, um, that goes for them as well because. I always have students coming to me, you know, handing me their device. This doesn't work. Um, and I realize, oh, well, you're not in class. And you've got a motivation to some extent to dawdle here. And so I usually come up with the makeshift solution. You know, guess what? We'll just print this or we'll just get the teacher to, you know, have you do an alternate or we'll do some or I'll hold on to this and you can have another device for, for the end of class and and we'll work it out. But I try to get them back to class, get right. them back into the routine right away. Um, I, I, you know, and it depends on the size of your school, but I'll walk them back a lot of times. I'll be like, mm -hmm. oh, well, I, I see the problem. Let's go back to your class right now. And I walk it back and I just explain to the teacher, sure. here's the problem and here's what I can do or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. That's true. I have done that too, but that tends to be when a teacher might have made a little bit of an error, and then I'm helping them <laughs> get to that point too. Oh, uh, now we just scared them. <laughs> but um, so it's it is a lot of thinking through um, the turning in assignments process. A lot of teachers have an extremely well thought out process of how to turn in paper but then when they do something digital they have nothing thought out i mean i've seen it you know with these inboxes and the kids have to put them in special slots and they have to put certain headings and numbers and and it's it's a miracle that you know the kids ever get all that learned but in the digital environment it's the same way and um our biggest issue was google classroom came out excellent Great feature. Teachers never told them to press the turn in button. They just never bothered to mention that. And so they would ask me, they go, well, gosh, you know, half of my kids don't turn in their work. And I would be asking, well, are, did they learn to press the turn it in button? And they didn't even know it was there. They didn't realize that they had to do that. And I said, well, that's a big part of the process and I explained that you know that means that you now are the owner and they don't have editing rights anymore so it gives you time to provide the feedback for everyone and I talked well, about turning it back to them too <laughs> and every time I try a new tool a new technological technology tool I always work it through the entire process mm -hmm. and say okay once the kids created whatever that it, it is that I want them to create. Now, how are they going to get that to me? What's the easiest way we can work this? And um, cause, uh, because it, we've all ran into where we've had them do, I don't know, a, a Prezi, and then the kid says, well, I don't know how to get it to you. And uh, oh, I didn't really think about how to get that to me, you know. And, and uh, um, you know, like, like when I first started doing digital note cards, for research papers. So then I'm like, okay, wait a second. I don't want every single kid to share every single card with me because then I'll have hundreds of note cards with no organization in my in my uh, Google Drive. So you, you have to work through that for and, and test it out and see how do you want to do it. And sometimes, like the digital note cards, I just have them take a screenshot of all their note cards mm -hmm. and then send me the screenshot. And that, that that way I can see their note cards, but I'm not getting 25 documents from each kid. Um, so, so have you taken a look at the brand new Google Cast that came out uh, back in June at ISTE? I've and seen documentation on it or stories about it, but I have not had a chance to try it. Well, because it is still um, beta testing, it's, still, it's not like widely out there. Um, but I have used it and this is what it does, just exactly what you're saying. It's a way for students to share to teachers what's on their screen. And the teacher then can either project it so the whole class can see it or the teacher can simply see it. Now, how does that work for turning in or maybe just plain 
like you were saying, taking a look at something quickly, you could have the kids, and it is the kids pushing to the teacher what's on their screen. So if I need to see your work, I can simply say, hey, why don't you go ahead and cast that so I can take a look at how you're doing that problem and go to class, go around the room and check those right from your machine. Now I know last year um, we worked a little bit with uh, the classroom share extension, which works two ways, which the teacher can share out to the class something that's on their screen, but the kids can also share back to the teacher. So it's it's a two two way sharing mm -hmm. device. Whereas um, the new, I guess it's it's considered Google Cast. I think is the name of it. Is really one direction at this point. Mm -hmm. But it's an option. It it, sa it sounds um, interesting, and I'll be be excited to see it. Um, they did have tone for a while, and it's still but you can still <laughs> use tone. But I have not figured tone out, so. I'm not going to really spend a lot of time talking about Google Tone because I we have not did. figured out. We yeah. used Google Tone in one um, one month. We, we played around with it, but we couldn't get 100% accuracy with it, anything popping on the kid's screen. And for, for people who are listening, it would actually send out a audible tone. And any anyone who also had Google Tone loaded as an extension would then receive the um, your microphone had to be on that's one piece of it that was tough because some people had their microphones turned off okay mm -hmm. um, but it was good it was really really interesting probably came out of project X from Google you know one of those mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, so I am a real fan too of and and just lastly to put it in here, making sure that your classroom management has something to do with your parents as well. And even if it's simply a calendar that students and parents see together, I think your parents ought to be aware that this is what we're doing in class and here's the information about it. Um, that is a classroom management scheme because what happens is the parents are informed that today we learned this and they may even ask what did you do in class today you know and that's part of just checking up um so i know we keep saying google classroom there are plenty of other you know there's learning management systems that do a lot of things but google classroom has a calendar that you can share with parents and i understand now google classroom will be available for parent logins is that correct i've heard that um mm -hmm. i haven't seen any official documentation i've heard people that were at isd um said that the google for education people told them it was coming that there's mm -hmm. going to be a parent portal of some sort, and the parents will be able to log in and see their students' Google Classroom. Um, so, but I, I have not seen any official documentation to know when that's coming out or how that'll work exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's a possibility. What, from my understanding, what most people do is just say your kid needs to give you their login, and you log in as your kid if you really want to see what. Right. Um, what's going on in, in Google Classroom. Um, that's why it's also good to post assignments somewhere else where the parents can see it. Sure. Um, Things even like remind, um, you know, throwing a text out just once a day isn't a bad idea. Um, but as we know, positive reinforcement works the best and um, really nice way to do it and you can set it up yourself with a Google form on your phone, a drop down with your students. You pick five students a day to write a kind note. If you use something like Autocrat or Formule, it'll make a nice email. Send it right off to the parents. When you see the activity or the behavior that you want to see, you can simply say, hey, 
thanks. I really liked it that Jenny today did this. And you, that goes a long way in ensuring that behavior continues. So for anybody who wants to figure out how to do that, sort of not necessarily canned, but in an automated way and quickly mm -hmm. and easily, um, take a look at uh, Formula is one excellent uh, Google Forms add-on that works beautifully for sending out emails from a Google Form. It's called Mail Merge for people who might understand spreadsheet terminology. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. Um, wh one thing that I thought of um, that a lot of people don't really think of, when we, uh, my school is split between Chromebooks and iPads. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but we had, we used to have more iPads and Chromebooks, now it's the other way around. But um, some of the teachers, especially the math teacher, she's like, well, how can students do math on a, an iPad? And we were coming up with different ways, and then it hit me. The kids, a lot of the kids want a stylus. Mm -hmm. And it's something you don't think about when you're equipping an entire class with with uh, iPads to, to also get style I, I guess would be the plural of stylus. Um, so what I did, uh, I mean, I found some on Amazon that were not very expensive, but every time I go to a big conference, go to the exhibit hall, and a ton of the exhibitors are giving away st a stylus with their company logo on it. So I just wander by those booths 10 different times and grab a handful of styluses, or styli, and then I've got a classroom set of um, stylus that, you know, a, a lot of our teachers will just say, if you want to use them, you can. If you don't want to use them, you don't have to. If you like, if you don't mind using your finger or whatever. But some students still like um, holding a stylus and using that for different reasons, for writing or drawing or, or whatnot. Um, so having a set, even if it's five or six that the kids can use, um, you can get them pretty cheap on Amazon. They don't have to be really high quality ones, mm -hmm. but it's, it's something to, to think about and, and have available for students who like to use those. And with the touchscreen Chromebooks that are out now, um, you might really want that because we've got two models now that flip into tablet form, and they can't. You can write pretty nicely on them. Mm -hmm. And since you're talking about stuff. And that's sometimes teachers feel like devices in the classroom is like juggling stuff. Um, we are in a BYOD environment where we have a variety of different power adapters coming into the school. So we have to have charging stations and we have to make sure that we have built into the classroom a way to adjust when a student needs to get to a charging station. Some teachers are very flexible about that with flexible seating, which is a much more responsive classroom design. You know, you can say, oh, we can move your desk this way. We can move your chair this way. We can move you this way. Um, but you do need to think that through and you need to have, if, if this is a, a concern that you might need charging in the middle of the day, you've got to offer that to the kids and you've got to have ways that they can do it conveniently without a huge, massive, disruption. Um, I'm an advocate for Velcro. I think if you're going to use power strips, you need to Velcro them to whatever surface it is, attach them in some way to a surface so that kids are just plugging and unplugging without getting involved in moving it all around and, and having the wires dragged all over the room. Um, we're lucky we have in our math classrooms, we have desks that have the electrical trough and so all the electricity is inside the desk and the kids can power at any time just sitting right where they are but that's not the norm throughout the building that's only in some of our math classes so what we've asked is that students because every student has math we say if you need to power a device do it in math class and then hopefully they're coming to school with the device powered it may only need the one charge during the day and it should get them through the day that's a school-wide. I, I found a uh, power strip, and I wish I could remember the name. It's like quirky or something like that. Is but it, it wavy? It, you, yeah, you can shape it. 
yes. <laughs> um, each each component is, and, and I found those very helpful. And I can, especially with spheros, I can shape it into an oval, stick it in a box, and then put all the spheros around it and charge all the spheros quite easily that way. Uh, so th things like that that help you. Mm -hmm. uh, because some of the, like, I don't know if you've seen the Sphero chargers, but they're big. And in a regular oh, yes. in a regular power strip, they can't fit side by side. And so I had to get something that was either wider or adjustable, and I found these adjustable ones that are uh, very helpful. You can also buy, if you're in a laptop environment or even Chromebook environment, you can get... I've seen them on Amazon, the universal uh, power adapters that have all the different tips. So let's say the kid forgot. <laughs> Never happens, but if a kid actually forgot their power adapter and they happen to have a device that you just don't have the power adapters to, then you might have one in that universal kit. And it's usually a 90 watt adapter with all the different tips that fit a variety, Toshiba, Dell, you name it. Does it fit the Nexus phones? <laughs> I That's a good question. I would have to double check. But um, <laughs> it'll tell you. It says on the list all the different devices it will fit. And so if you are looking for a specific group of devices, it should be there. And well, we both laugh because we both have a Nexus phone. Mm -hmm. And it's a different, it was it, uh, the USB-C or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to go buy all new chargers. Uh, for for all you know, for my car, for my, for, you know, it, it had to buy all kinds of different chargers just for that phone. But I love the phone, so. Yep, we aren't the only ones that have had to get different chargers for different devices. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, teachers right now are probably saying, "Oh my gosh, I really probably need to sit down and plan that out." And you know, this is a good time to just jot some things down. There's some great websites out there. If you start looking for responsive instruction, that's a good uh, keyword to look for. Um, classroom management and then one-to-one -one classroom management devices. Edutopia has had several articles in the past year about classroom management. And it's just, it's a topic that we forget any other time of the year, but right now, is your your brains on it sit down jot down some notes from this and then you'll have it you'll be able to form your own and make it your personality you were talking about down and around I think we say tip the top okay and that just means close it at least you know 45 degrees so that you can't see it <laughs> yeah the only reason I added the around is because some kids are afraid their computer would turn off when it was the screen was down and <laughs> Uh, sure. This this is actually back when we had the old Lenovo laptops that would actually you know shut off the Windows laptops. And, <laughs> yes. And then it's a five minute process for them to log back in. Mode, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So with Chromebooks, it's not it's not an issue as much. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, back when those old laptops we had. Oh yeah, recall. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well. Um, if anyone is having like a dilemma about classroom management, um, it'd be really interesting to hear from them. It would how, be. How can they write you? The website for us is flippedlearningremixed.com. Um, if, you, if you just want to find out more, but you can also send me a message on Twitter at T Cockrum, T C O C K R U M. Um, you can okay. always email me. Um, it's Mr. Cockrum at mrcockrum.com, but Twitter is probably a little bit better way to find me and, and send me a message. How about you, Joan? I am at digiteacher on Twitter, and my email is digiteacher at gmail.com. That's easy enough to remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I cornered the market on it. <laughs> All right. I think that wraps up this week and um please we're going to be podcasting often so please come back and hear more yeah we got some good topics lined up that we're uh planning and now we're 
going to be back in school year routine, we'll be able to record more often. So um, thanks for listening, and we will talk to you again soon.